All right. We are going to start our lecture here on um, chapter 21, performing a physical assessment. You guys can find this in your book starting on page 499. So when we're talking about doing a physical examination. So this is part of a general health assessment. So this is an assessment of the physical, mental, spiritual, socioeconomic, cultural status of an individual group or community. Okay, that's a general health assessment. A physical examination is part of that, okay? It is used to gather data about the client and it focuses on functional abilities and responses to illness and stressors, okay? So a physical examination or a head to toe physical assessment is the cornerstone of the nursing practice. It is one of the most important skills that you will learn in nursing school. And it is the most frequent skill that you will use period in this entire career of yours. So the point of this is to um, focus on the client um, and obtain baseline data. Okay, so baseline data meaning uh, data about the physical status and functional abilities that are going to serve as a baseline for comparison and changes in the future. Okay. Um, it's also important time to be able to identify nursing diagnoses and collaborative problems um, to be able to collaborate with other healthcare professionals. And we will do screening for health problems. So depending on the type of physical examination that we perform, it's going to depend on the client's health status, the nature of the encounter, for example, at an outpatient appointment for an annual physical, or on a client's admission into an inpatient study setting or an initial home health visit. All of these settings, you would perform an, a, an initial comprehensive physical assessment. Um, there's multiple types of physical examinations or physical assessments. Um, there's a comprehensive. So what this one is about. So this is a health history interview and a head to toe exam of all body systems. For example, this is something you may have experienced in the form of an annual physical or um, the very first assessment you get as you get admitted into the hospital or um, initial home health visit or something of the sort. Then there's a focused assessment. So a focused assessment is instead of an overall health assessment where they go head to toe, a focused assessment is looking at a particular focus. For example, a patient walks into the ER with a specific complaint and that area is assessed. If they come in because their ankle has pain, then we go to a focused assessment where we may check for to see if they can walk. Can they bear weight on their ankle? What does their ankle look like? Let's ask questions about their ankle, things like that. That's a focused assessment. And then there's a system specific assessment. So this is an assessment focused on just one body system. For example, checking respiratory status on a patient who's complaining of shortness of breath. Okay, we would maybe get um, a blood oxygen level. We would get, um, listen to lung sounds. We would check peripheral circulation. We would um, ask them if they have a cough, things like that. That would be a system specific assessment. And then there's an ongoing assessment. So. Ideally, this would be at every interaction with the patient. We're gonna look at how they look. How are they acting mentally? Is everything seem like it's intact? Um, and then it's gonna evaluate client outcomes per the nursing process and all of that. Okay, so when we're preparing ourselves to do an assessment, we need to be prepared. First of all, nothing makes the patient and family doubt you faster than lack of preparation. Okay, so we need to know theoretical knowledge. We need to know basic anatomy and physiology. When we're doing a physical head to toe assessment, we need to know anatomy and physiology. Okay, we need to know assessment techniques, which we'll talk about. So that including inspection, where we look at the body, auscultation, where we listen to the body, palpation, where we feel the body. Okay, and then percussion, which we'll talk about, which isn't used as often, but that is, um, we'll talk about that in a minute, but that's another assessment technique as well. So those are some things that you need to know. We need to know, have self-knowledge. So we need to be, um, we need to be skillful um, in the skill and we need to be comfortable performing the skill, okay? We need to have willingness to seek help. If we notice that something is off or maybe we can't find a pulse or something of the sort, we need to go ask for help. Hey, I, I didn't really feel a pedal pulse on this patient. Can you come see if you can try? Teamwork makes the dream work, right? 
and then knowledge about the client situation. So we want to know the reason that we're doing a head-to-toe examination. We want to know what's the client's past diagnoses, what's going on with them, and we want to know what is in their plan of care. Next, we want to prepare the environment. So I want you to always think about the fact that privacy is key in nursing, okay? Maintaining privacy is so, so important. This goes for any procedure, not just assessments, but bed baths, uh, using a bedpan, anything, even just being in their room, if they would like their door shut, that's providing a form of privacy for them, okay? When we're performing skills like assessments or bed baths, it's important that we only expose areas that we're currently assessing. We keep all other areas covered to maintain their privacy and their dignity, okay? So draping, that's what that means, covering areas that we don't need to see or use at that time. And then using privacy curtains. So if there's a double occupancy room, we would pull the privacy curtain so the other patient on the other side of the room doesn't see or hear what we're doing, right? We wanna to tend to noise control. Make sure that there's not a lot of background noise, TV, radio, computer, sounds, people on their phones, convey realistic expectations so that they know, you know, it's time to pay attention so that I can speak to you about your medical diagnoses and we can get your physical assessment out of the way, okay? And then we're gonna enable visualization. So we wanna make sure we have adequate lighting. We wanna grab a flashlight if needed, which sounds silly probably at the at first glance of that, but. I can't tell you how many times a flashlight has been used by me when placing a Foley catheter into a female's urethra, okay? In labor and delivery, we have huge lights on the ceiling that we're able to shine directly into that area so that we can find exactly what we're looking for, which is lovely. Then we wanna make sure that we control the temperature. Obviously, we're gonna be exposing our patient at, at different times um, to be able to um, investigate and do our assessment. So we wanna make sure that the temperature is comfortable for them. And then we want to make sure that we have um, the appropriate equipment. So we're going to need a thermometer, a stethoscope, blood pressure equipment. We may need PPE, depending on the patient's diagnosis. Um, it just depends on what you may encounter. But you want to make sure that you bring everything into the room that you need at that time. Then we're going to prepare the client. So we always want to promote client comfort. We want to develop a rapport with the client by introducing ourselves, letting them know our name and title. Um, ask them how they wish to be addressed. Ask them their specific pronouns. Explain what you're going to be doing to the client. Ask them to pee before they get an examination. This is going to promote relaxation. It's going to make it easier for them when you start palpating their abdomen, right? We're always going to make sure to let the patient know before we actually touch them. Get permission to touch them. You would be surprised at how many people has, have traumatic histories where people don't ask for permission and it's very triggering for them. So we always want to demonstrate respect by asking for position or asking for permission and um, telling them what we're going to do next. Um, we want to um, make sure that we let them know, give them an idea of how long we're going to be with them, explain exactly what we're doing, and then thank them. So if anybody works at the hospital, you may know what ADET is. That's the big initiative for the hospital. So ADET, A-I-D-E-T, that stands for acknowledge, introduce, duration, explanation, and thank you, okay? We're gonna acknowledge the client, Mr. or Mrs. whoever, introduce yourself by name and title, duration, tell them how long this procedure is gonna take, explain what we're gonna do, and then thank them before we leave, right? We always want to make sure that we're respecting cultural differences. For example, some clients may wish to have a family member present during an exam, and some may require that um, they have a same-sex clinician, okay? So we want to make sure, especially also if there's a language barrier, we want to make sure that there's an interpreter present for those um, situations. We also want to use proper positioning. So to begin the examination, we're going to seat the client on the side of the bed or the exam table, and we're going to face the client and establish eye contact. This is going to help to build rapport and put that client at ease, okay? So if your client is unable to sit, we can help them into a position on their back with the head of the bed elevated. An upright position is going to allow the client to fully expand their lungs, which is going to be useful for assessing vital signs and listening to the lungs and the heart and the back and the upper extremities, okay? As you place your client into positions that allow you to best observe the body and system that you're examining, just be alert to special needs that you may need to um, convey to them and asking for permission, explaining to them what we're gonna do, okay? So let's test your knowledge. So to demonstrate safe and effective nursing care during the physical exam, we want to what? 
establish mutual goals with the clients, or B, maintain a strict routine regardless of patient values, religious beliefs, needs, or preferences. C, implement interventions in a manner that will save time. Or D, ask direct questions and decision-making to the client's spouse or support person. The correct answer here is A, okay? It's super important to provide goal-directed, client-centered care by establishing mutual goals with the clients. Okay, we always want to demonstrate respect for clients' values and religious beliefs. Um, and we want to make sure to always take into account their needs and preferences. We will always implement interventions to promote client comfort. And we will only ask questions to the patient um, as, and not to their spouse. We want to ask them directly to the patient, especially if we know that they're able to answer them. So physical assessment techniques, which we talked a little bit about already. So these are the four major skills that's going to be used in your physical assessment. The first one is inspection. This is the use of sight to gather data. What do you see? Palpation. This is using your touch to gather data. Percussion. This is what I was talking about that's not used as routinely anymore, but this is tapping your fingers on the skin and using short strokes and listening to the noises from the taps. A lot of times you'll be able to hear sharp or dull sounds, and that can tell you based on the vibration of those sounds where organs are located, if they're swollen, things like that. But again, not routinely practiced much anymore. And then auscultation. So this is the use of hearing to, to gather data, right? Um, and then there's an additional clinical skill that you may use, and that's olfaction, which is your sense of smell. Some clinicians may not consider this a formal assessment skill. However, you will definitely use this skill in the clinical setting. Olfaction adds information to the data that you collect. It can, can give you a variety of information, okay? So we use that as well. So let's talk about those. So inspection, this is the use of sight to gather data, okay? So tools to enhance inspection. There may be an otoscope. Right, so an otoscope, that's something that you use to look inside your patient's ears. You would look at their eardrum. Their eardrum should be gray in color. For an adult, we're gonna pull their ear up and back to be able to visualize that. And that straightens that eardrum canal using an otoscope. If we're looking into a child's ear, we're gonna pull their ear down and back and that's gonna straighten that ear canal on the child and allow us to see with our otoscope. So otoscope will help. An ophthalmoscope will help as well. That's something that can help look into the eyes, okay? And then a pin light. You'll need a pin light as we go through lab and we talk about checking pupillary response and things like that. So a pin light will help us as well. Um, examples of inspection. So you uh, looking at skin color, are they nice and pink, okay? Are they cyanotic? What's their gait look like? How are they walking? Are they unsteady on their feet? Are they walking normal? Do they have an abnormal gait? What's their general appearance? Are they dressed for the weather? Do they look clean? Um, what's their behavior? Are they acting normal and appropriate to the situation? And then palpation. So this one is the use of touch to gather data. So when using palpation, we're assessing temperature we're assessing skin texture, we're assessing moisture and anatomical landmarks such as, and such abnormalities like edema, which is swelling, or looking for masses, feeling tumors even, um, or areas of tenderness. That All of this can be assessed by palpation, right? So it always begins with light pressure moving to deep pressure, okay? Um, there should always be caution with the use of deep palpation because sometimes it can cause more harm than good. So I would just stay at a moderate pressure level and not ever get too deep with that. Um, different parts of your hands can be used. So the fingertips can be used for tactile discrimination, right? The dorsum of the hand, which is the top part, can use, be used for temperature determination if you've ever checked your own, your kid's forehead to see if they have a fever, right? Um, and then the palm, so the general area of pulsation, right? We can check that as well. Um, and then grasping with the fingers and, and thumb, checking a mass evaluation, maybe a mass in the abdomen or something. For example, when using our hands or our touch, we're going to check for these things, with, like we said, swelling or edema, moisture, um, masses, things like that. As we begin to move through the assessment of each body system, always inform the client that you're about to touch them and use a gentle approach. Make sure that your hands are warm. We don't want our super cold hands touching them to be uncomfortable and always begin with light pressure, okay? 
when you are assessing every part of the body, you're going to do it in um, a specific order with your inspection. You always want to look first. You always want to look first. Okay. So look at everything before you touch it so that you can see what it looks like. Okay. As you move forward, you can listen next. Okay. You always want to listen before you touch because touching sometimes can change the sounds that you're going to hear when you listen. So that's important for you to know. Even though palpation is listed second on here, I want you to know that especially with the abdomen most specifically, we always want to look at the abdomen, then we want to listen to it, then we can touch it. We don't ever want to touch before we listen. We don't want to mess up those bowel sounds. And then talking about percussion. So this is tapping your fingers on the skin using short strokes. That tapping produces vibrations and the resulting sound allows you to determine location, size, and density of those underlying structures. So percussion is especially useful when you're assessing the abdomen and the lungs. Um, for example, when trying to notice a distended bladder, right? And so here on this slide, you can see different percussion sounds. So if it sounds flat, typically a bone or a muscle. If it sounds dull, that's a, like typically heart, liver, spleen. If there's resonance, that means that it's air filled or hollow. Hyper resonance, which means that there's other types of hyper inflated lungs, right? And then timpani, air filled stomach. So a lot of these words probably mean nothing to you. And if I'm being honest, I've never percussed in, in anything in my career. So it's really not used routinely, but we do still have to teach it to you. And then lastly, auscultation, right? So auscultation is the use of hearing to gather data. So there's two different kinds of auscultation. There's direct auscultation and there's indirect auscultation. So with direct, this is listening without using an instrument. So this means listening with your ears, okay? Only your ears. So if you have heard wheezing or a chest congestion or something without using a stethoscope, then you've performed direct auscultation. When performing indirect auscultation, this is typically what we think of in a healthcare environment. So this is listening with the help of a stethoscope or a tool, right? So um, when we're thinking about, you know, actually let's, oh yeah, for example, these would be listening to heart sounds or lung sounds with your stethoscope, okay? So let's test your knowledge. So if I hear Strider, when the patient is telling me their name, how would I document that? I hear Strider when the patient is telling me their name. I would document this as Strider heard during direct auscultation, okay? Now, if I hear Strider when I'm auscultating breath sounds, how would I document that? I would document that as Strider noted during indirect auscultation, okay? So that's the difference between the two. Let's test your knowledge. So the nurse would be able to gather the most complete data about a client's pedal edema using the assessment skill of A, inspection, B, palpation, C, percussion, or D, auscultation. So remember, breaking this question down, pedal meaning foot, right? And edema meaning level of swelling. If anybody's ever seen pitting edema where it's so swollen on the foot or the leg, typically the lower extremities, but can also happen on the upper extremities as well. Um, if you push down on their tissue, it will literally leave your fingerprint there for a predetermined amount of time, depending how bad the swelling is. And that's edema. Okay. So the correct answer is B. While inspection will alert the nurse to the presence of edema, palpation or touching the edema will determine the degree to which it has occurred right? There we go. So age modifications for the physical assessment. So what are we going to do differently because of age? So typically for an infant, okay, this is typically referring to a child less than a year old. These babies usually feel most secure if a parent holds them during the examination, either against their chest or for older infants who can sit without support than on the parent's lap. Otherwise, we're going to position the infant on a padded exam table, okay? We want to make sure to attend to safety in that aspect and never walk away from that exam table while that baby is sitting on it alone. For toddlers, this is about one to three years of age because they may be very fearful of invasive procedures such as examination of the mouth or the inner ear. We're going to perform those procedures last, okay? Most toddlers enjoy making choices, so this characteristic to, to promote 
the toddler's cooperation is a good idea. So allow the child to show you their de developmental skills. If they need assistance to remove clothing, have the parents help and observe how the parent and child interact. Always praise the toddler for his or her abilities and cooperation. This sets the stage for positive feelings about healthcare. Okay. So for preschoolers, three to five year olds, as appropriate, allow the preschool child to sit in the parent's lap if they wish. By age five, most children will be comfortable enough to lie on the examination table if a parent is present. You should let the child help with the exam. For example, have the child hold the equipment or remember his or her height and weight. That would get them involved and excited about their health care. Give reassurance as you go through the examination. For example, your lungs sound very healthy. Always compliment the child on their cooperation as well. For school-aged children, this is ages 6 to 12, we're going to develop a rapport with them by asking the child about his or her favorite school or play activities. We're going to allow the child to undress him or herself and get up and down from the exam table and demonstrate your equipment before you use it. The school-aged child will be interested in how his or her body works, so use this opportunity for teaching. And then with adolescents, this is age 13 to 24. So these kiddos may be strongly influenced by peer values. So emphasize lifestyle habits that promote wellness, including a healthy diet, adequate rest and exercise, avoiding tobacco, alcohol, and other drugs as well. Also discuss sexually transmitted infections and cancer, particularly testicular cancer and HPV with these, with these kids. Um, the first pelvic examination and breast examination usually take place in these teen years. So because, and because suicide is the third lead, leading cause of death among adolescents, you should use this opportunity to screen kids for depression and suicide. Address concerns that these children are normal as they're likely going through puberty at this time and provide them reassurance in that route. And then young and middle adults, age 18 to 35, and then 36 to 55, typically cooperative, don't require a modified approach unless there's a chronic Ill illness or some type of disability. Um, older adults, so this is greater than 55 years old. You may need to adapt your exam to limit position changes due to health conditions of the older adult like COPD or arthritis. Um, when you consider um, adapting to vision and hearing changes. We're talking if, if they have sensory deficits, always telling them what you're doing, talking a little bit louder if they have hearing problems. Assess for changes in their physical ability and their ability to perform activities of daily living, right? Provide periods of rest as needed. When assessing an older adult, remembering the acronym SPICES will help you remember common problems of the elderly that require nursing interventions. Spices, the S for sleeping disorders, the P for problems with eating or feeding, the I for incontinence, the C for confusion, the E for evidence of falls, and the S for skin breakdown. See what we all have to look forward to as we get old? It's terrible. All right, so test your knowledge. So let's explain why it's necessary or beneficial to modify your physical examination techniques based on your client's age. Who benefits from these modifications and how might your results be affected if you neglected these modifications? So the basic techniques of physical assessment remain the same for all age groups, but your approach will vary according to the developmental stage of your patient, as we know. So exam modifications are going to be made to ensure that the data we collect is accurate while maintaining comfort and safety of our patient. For instance, we know infants feel most secure if their parent holds them during an exam while adolescents are typically self-conscious and may wish to be examined with their parents out of the room. Older adults may need rest periods and during physical activity, they may tire easily. So both the nurse and the client can benefit from these modifications. The nurse will better be able to collect assessment data if she creates a therapeutic relationship with the client and the client will be comfortable and safe during their physical exam and trust the relationship and it will be a, the relationship will be established, right? And so neglecting these modifications may impact your ability to create a therapeutic relationship with your client. Additionally, the client may be scared, tired, or just not willing to fully participate in the examination, okay? Then our examination may end up being incomplete, right? So this is where we get into the actual physical assessment procedure. So um, first step, this is the general survey, 
Okay, so this begins at the first contact. This is your overall impression of the patients. Okay, so as we're looking, we're gonna look at their body type and their posture. As we introduce ourselves, we greet ourselves, we're going to assess for muscle strength, mobility, skin temperature and texture, but posture is also a clue about overall health status. So a slump position may indicate fatigue or depression, pain. We wanna pay attention to their speech. speech. As we speak with them, um, we ask them health-related questions. Look for clues, like are they using inappropriate or illogical responses that may show they have some kind of psychiatric disorder? Do they have difficulty speaking or changes in their voice quality that may indicate some kind of neurological problem? Do they have rapid speech? Do they act like they have anxiety? Do they have hoarseness, which could inflammate, they have inflammation or cancer of the throat? Do they have slow speech, which may be from depression or sedation? Do they have, are they appropriate in the situation? Are they responding appropriately? We would then get their height and weight. We would determine their body mass index, their BMI, right? And um, that's kind of the general survey. What do we get from just kind of looking at them and who they are as a person? Then we're gonna move on to the skin assessment. I, I want to also point out, let me go back a slide. With this general survey, we may, with mental state, where it says mental state on here, we want to always do a neurological exam on our patient, okay? So when we start with a neurological exam, we just ask a couple of questions. We wanna know, typically the questions I ask, do you know your name? Yes, I know my name, Stormy Hatfield. Do you know where you are? Yes, I'm at Ivy Tech Community College. And do you know who the president is? And I say, yes, I do know who the president is. And then I would say who the president is. So that would tell me that my patient is alert because they're able to talk to me and they're oriented, which means they correctly answered all of those questions. So they're alert and oriented times three. I asked three questions. They're alert and oriented to person, place, and time, okay? So moving on to our skin assessment, right? So we're gonna check out their integumentary system. So we're gonna look at their skin color. We're gonna look at the temperature. We're gonna look at the texture and the turgor, right? So when we're talking about skin color, <clears throat> we want to make sure um, that we're assessing for, are they cyanotic, okay? Are they cyanotic in color? Are they pink in color, okay? Um, what's their skin, skin characteristics? So temperature, are they warm? Are they dry? Is there moisture? Are they dry? Are they sweaty? Um, what's their texture like? They have a rough texture. Is their skin smooth? Are there any lesions on their body? Do they have any scabs? Does it look like they have lots of scabs? Does it look like they have cuts? Um, that kind of thing. Uh, also skin turgor, which I know I've mentioned in a couple of videos as well. You can actually see the procedure on your screen here. Um, and it shows here skin with decreased turgor remains elevated after being pulled up and released. So you can see in this picture, this person is pulling it up and as she lets go, it remains tinted. That is um, decreased skin turgor, which shows dehydration, okay? So we're gonna check that turgor. We typically check it here on the top of the hand. It can also be on the thin skin of the chest as well. And we're gonna look at their hair. We're gonna say, is their hair sparse? Are they experiencing, um, are we experiencing uh, loss? Are there any, is there lice in their hair? You know, is the, is there hair loss anywhere? Um, we're going to look at the color, the temperature, the texture of the hair as well. So we're going to look at their nails. So healthy nail beds are level and they're firm and they're similar to the color of the skin. Um, the nail should be smooth and uniform in texture. And we want to examine the nails on both the hands and feet. However, you may defer an examination of the toenails until you're accessing for peripheral circulation at that time. Variations in color and shape and texture of the nails may indicate health problems. So we talked about clubbing in um, our vital signs briefly in our vital signs um, chapter. So I have a picture of that on the next slide I will show you. And then we're gonna check capillary refill. So capillary refill, refill is to be checked on the nail beds, okay? So in order to check capillary refill, we briefly press the tip of the nail and then we release it and we observe a refill of color. So as you press it in the similar way to blanching, right? So you're basically blanching their nail. 
taking the blood away, turning their nail kind of a white color, and then you're looking for that pink refill, okay? Um, it should be less than three seconds to refill. Anything greater than three seconds could indicate poor circulation. So that's all part of the skin assessment. So here's a little bit more about assessment of the nails here. So um, an appropriate nail angle here should be uh, 160 degrees, right? Um, and so you can see here to the right of your screen that this is clubbing in which the nail plate angle is 180 degrees here. See, it's associated with long-term hypoxic states such as chronic, chronic lung, lung disease, okay? And then there's something also called spoon-shaped nails, which can occur from iron deficiency as well. Here's some other things that you may see on um, the skin. Okay, so up here in the upper left corner, so this is cyanosis that we keep talking about. So if the patient is cyanotic in one area, be sure to check other areas, right? That's that bluish hue to the skin. The location for cyanosis is important for determining what's going on. So if it's central cyanosis, like it's the lips, the tongue, that is hypoxia, right? That tells you they have a low block blood oxygen level. They're blue. Acrocyanosis. So this is something that newborn babies have and it's located on their hands and feet and it's not abnormal. It goes away as they age, but it's not abnormal in the first uh, few months of life. So if hands and feet are only um, cold, that could be typically due to temperature and the patient may also have a circulatory disorder like Raynaud's phenomenon, which is, is happens sometimes. Okay, and down below the cyanosis, you can see petechiae and purpura, right? So these are types of sub-Q, uh, subcutaneous hematomas. They all have a reddish, bluish, purplish color and it's caused by hemoglobin in the blood leaking from the capillaries. Petechiae are typically small, non-blanching lesions and purpura are a little bit larger. So you can see that on this, um, on this picture. In the middle here, you can see um, a picture of jaundice. So this is the yellowish coloring of the skin and the eyes, okay? Um, typically occurs in the mucous membrane. So it can be the skin, it can be the eyes, it can be inside the mouth. Um, and it has a progression where it goes from head to toe. So if you see jaundiced eyes, then start moving down the body to see where the jaundice ends, okay? Um, on the right upper side, you'll see a picture of modeling. So modeling is most common in babies due to autonomic nervous system immaturity and overstimulation. Um, and it's not typically a good sign in adults. It's typically due to peripheral vasoconstriction because the body is trying to maintain blood pressure and circulation to vital organs. This is a lot of times, which this does happen to, actually it happens to me sometimes when I get really cold, I'll be able to see my legs do that. But a lot of times you'll see that in the dying process in the elderly, they'll start to model and that'll be a sign of death is coming. And then at the very bottom, last but not least is pallor. Okay, so if your patient's skin looks pale, it's a good idea to check the conjunctiva also. Remember that the conjunctiva is the whites of the, or sorry, the pink part of the, the eye if you pull it down as seen in this picture. It should be nice and pink. Some people are just pale, okay? But their conjunctiva will be normal and pink if they are, um, if they are okay. So if their conjunctiva look like this picture, then we have a concern. They're probably very anemic. Anything where your hemoglobin is less than seven needs to be transfused most of the time. Um, to, and a determination needs to be made as to why they're so severely anemic. Let's test your knowledge. So it would be most important for the nurse to include the fingernails in a basic assessment for the client in which type of, of condition? A, neurological, B, musculoskeletal, C, integumentary, or D, respiratory? Correct answer is D. I know you wanted to say integumentary, didn't you? So changes in the color of the nail bed as well as the shape and texture of the nail can indicate underlying issues with oxygenation, okay? So moving on to the head and the eyes, okay? So when we are assessing the skull and the face, so the skull should be smooth to palpation with no unusual bulges. Um, we want to report any bulging or tenderness or congenital anomalies that we may see or previous surgeries. 
Um, any irregular jaw movement is what we would be looking for as well. So cracking of the jaw may indicate TMJ or a temporomandibular joint syndrome. Um, and so we would wanna document that as well. As we're looking at the eyes, so when examining the eyes, you're gonna inspect or look at and palpate the external eye structures, okay? We're gonna assess the vision and we're gonna examine the internal structures as well. I want you to remember this acronym. It is called PERLA, P-E-R-R-L-A. Write that down. You're gonna need to know that, especially when we do our skills this week in lab. What PERLA stands for is pupils. The P stands for pupils. The E stands for equal. The R stands for round. The R stands for reactive two, and the L stands for light, and the A stands for accommodation, okay? So what this means is that this is a normal finding, and this just means that your pupils constrict and your eyes converge as the patient attempts to focus on an object. Object. So in order to be able to appropriately document PERLA, you have to use your pen light and in a darkish room when your eyes dilate in the dark, right? And then you shine this bright light into their pupils and their pupils get smaller. And that's an appropriate reaction. That would be pupils reactive to light, right? And so then you look at the pupils. Are they round? Are they equal? Which means they're round and equal on both sides or is one bigger than the other, okay? And so pupils equal round and reactive to light, you just tested all of that. Accommodation is when you take something, which is usually your pen light, and you take it close to the patient's nose. And the patient's eyes should cross as it gets close to their face and they attempt to focus on that. And that would be accommodation when their eyes accommodate in that way. Okay? So that's when you're able to, to, to assess PERLA. You also just need to be aware of patients that are nearsighted and farsighted, patients that are colorblind and all of that. You also want to assess the sclera of the eye, which is just the whites of the eye, the white eyeball, so to speak. So that should be white, it should not be yellow, and so that's kind of what you're looking at. And so other assessments, so with the ear and hearing. So when we're doing a hearing test, um, there's a couple different tests that, oh dear, there's a couple different tests that can be done, including the Weber's test. So with the Weber's test, this is, um, includes a vibrating tuning fork, and it's placed on the center of a client's head and they should be able to sense the vibration equally in both ears, okay? It's a typically a positive Weber's test if the vibration is louder in one ear than the other. And then there's a Wren's test. So this is, if the Weber's test is positive, then you perform the Wren's test after that. And this is detecting the kind of hearing problem. So with the Wren's test, you also use a tuning fork and you compare air conduction to bone conduction. So typically it goes on top of the head and then it goes behind the ear vibrating the whole time. Again, these are not used very often, at least not that I've seen in my practice. Um, and then there's the Romberg's test as well. So with that, Romberg's test is to test for um, neurological symptoms and imbalance. So the client should be able to stand with their feet together and their eyes closed to maintain balance with minimal swaying. Okay, so they should be able to close their eyes, stand with their feet together with their eyes closed and not sway everywhere. So if they do start swaying and moving and not holding their balance, that would be considered a positive Romberg's test. This may indicate a vestibular, so an ear problem or a brain problem with the cerebellum. Okay, it's all about balance with that one. Um, and then an otoscopic um, examination. So again, like we talked about a little bit in the beginning, this is different depending on the client's age. So if you are um, looking with an otoscope into an adult's ears, we're going to pull the peanut, that top of their ear, we're going to pull that up and back. That straightens that ear canal. You should be able to look in there with your otoscope now and see the gray tympanic membrane. Okay, remember it's supposed to be gray. And then if you're assessing the tympanic membrane of a child, you're going to pull the peanut down and back, okay? And that's how you're gonna be able to straighten the ear canal on a child. So that's assessing the ears. When we're assessing the nose, we're going to, um, we're going to test the sense of smell, which typically diminishes in the older adults because of you know, typical, um, typical atrophy of those nerve fibers in there. 
but we can test our sense of smell by having them smell coffee beans or fresh mint or something and having them identify that smell, okay? We can check the patency of the nares. We look inside their nares and see if they have a deviated septum and ask them how they're breathing, if they're breathing okay. Then we can assess the mouth and the oropharynx, okay? So the lips, the buccal mucosa, which is the um, cheeks on the inside of the cheeks and the gums, all of these should be checked to be smooth, they should be moist and they should be pink in color. So increased pigmentation, bluish or dark patches can occur in dark skin clients, okay? Dark skin clients, you're also gonna have to check much more thoroughly for signs of cyanosis because it's harder to see in these clients. No lesions should be present in the mouth. So when inspecting the mouth, carefully examine all aspects of the tongue, um, all around it, okay? The tongue should be moist and symmetrical, slightly rough, smooth, pink, and freely movable, okay? So color of the tongue can be indicative of many, many things. So if you see a dry and furry tongue, that could be a sign of dehydration, dry and furry. Just think of like, well, like you know how you feel when you just haven't had enough water, just dry and furry, right? And then bright red and smooth tongue can be a sign of iron deficiency anemia. Okay, ulcerations may also indicate an allergy and a black hairy tongue can indicate a fungal disease. That sounds appetizing. Then we look at the hard palate, which is just that area at the very top of the mouth. And we look at the soft palate, which is to the back of the mouth on the upper side. That should all be pink and moist and intact. There should be no lesion, swelling, erythema, discharge or anything in that area. So moving on to the neck. So when we're assessing the neck, we're gonna look at the thyroid gland, right? So normally the thyroid is smooth and firm and non-tender, okay? It's often non-palpable where you can't even feel it. Thyroid abnormalities are very common though. An enlarged thyroid may be associated with um, hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism. Thyroid tenderness usually results from inflammation and those masses can be malignant, malignant but are usually benign. And then also to assess the neck, we're gonna look at the musculature. So we're just gonna look at it and see if, does everything look symmetrical on both sides? Is, is the thyroid gland, um, is the trachea midline? Is it in the middle where it should be, right? We're gonna look at that. We're gonna also assess the um, cervical lymph nodes, which just means the um, lymph nodes within the neck, right? So normal lymph nodes are small in size, usually less than one centimeter. They're typically mobile, they're soft, and they're non-tender. So you should describe enlarged lymph nodes according to their location, their size, their shape, consistency, mobility, and tenderness, okay? It could be caused by an infection or malignancy or other diseases. And you can see the location of those cervical lymph nodes here in the picture to the left of your screen. And then moving on to checking the breasts. So the breasts consist of glandular, adipose, and connective tissue and smooth muscles and nerves, okay? The functions of the female breasts are sexual stimulation and milk production for nourishing offspring, okay? Breast size and shape vary among women and commonly one breast is slightly larger than the other. Breast tissue and lymph drainage for um, the breasts extend up into the axilla or the armpit, right? The assessment of the breast should include a clinical breast exam, review of self-examination of the breast, and recommendations on when to start mam mammograms and things like that. Moving into the lungs. So when we're assessing the chest and lungs, we're going to describe the size and the shape of the chest. So there's all types of alterations, like spinal alterations, such as kyphosis which is an excessive curvature of that thoracic spine and scoliosis, if you know what that is, which is a lateral curvature of the spine. And these things can alter the thoracic cage, okay? Um, it's also important to, hold on one moment, there we go, okay. So chest landmarks can re be referred to in a variety of different names, as on the next slide, I'll show you in just a moment. Um, but when we're talking about breath sounds, we went over this a little bit in the vital signs chapter, right? 
So as we were thinking about this in the vital signs chapter, you still need to know these types of sounds, okay? So as far as bronchial breath sounds, these are loud, high-pitched sounds that are air moving through the trachea. So these are to be found in the upper by the neck, actually, okay? Then bronchial vesicular sounds. These are medium pitch with equal, equal air moving through, okay, in the large airways. You're going to hear these best over the first and second intercostal space adjacent to the sternum, okay? And then your vesicular breath sounds. These are breezy sounds, um, and these are likely going to be found throughout the lower lung fields and those other airways, right? So those are all just locations. Bronchial breath sounds, you can find those under a certain type, a certain area, but they're not they're not abnormal. Okay, those are normal. Bronchovesicular, those are normal. And vesicular, those are normal sounds as well. When you get into adventitious breath sounds, this just means that they are abnormal sounds. So in the category of this adventitious breath sound, that's where you get crackles and wheezes and ronchi and things like that under adventitious sounds. Okay. Breath sounds can also be diminished or misplaced. Um, and that's when they're heard with poor effort, okay? You can a lot of times hear these in very elderly or um, very muscular or very obese patients who have restricted blood flow or restricted airflow, I'm sorry. Oh, and actually, let me point this out while I'm here. If you can look here to this picture off to the right of your screen, you can see on page 570, you'll be able to get more details for that. But this is the order for respiratory auscultation. So this is a skill that you will have to perform in lab. And as you do your physical assessment on someone else, you do have to do lung sounds in a particular order. So as you can see the numbers here, one, two, three, four, you can see the arrows pointing you where to go. So what that's telling you is you're gonna listen to place one in the left lung. And then after you hear a few breaths there, you're gonna move to place two on the right lung. And then you're gonna do that all the way down. Then you're gonna go down to three and then four, both on opposite lungs, okay? Does that make sense? So when you do that, the point of that is so that you are constantly listening to the same spot on, the, on opposite lungs, but in the same area. So you compare the same spot on both lungs to see if one is worse or better than the other, okay? That's the really important part about that, but this is the correct um, way to assess long sounds. And then here's just a little fun picture on adventitious breath sounds. Okay, so here's crackles. This tells you snap, crackle, pop, discontinuous. Um, and then it even tells you some um, diagnoses that would be considered on, on this. So bronchitis, pneumonia, CHF. Okay, remember crackles are wet sounds. And then next, here's a wheeze. That's a wheeze one, right? And so you'll hear this in asthma and COPD. And that's one where you are breathing lots of air through a narrowed airway, right? It's because of, because of an airway obstruction. And then this last one is ronchi, so snoring type of sound. And it's suggesting secretions in the lower airways. And that's the one where if you hear it, you want to ask your patient to cough and see if they can clear it out. Because a lot of times we'll hear this in um, patients with that are smokers, right? And then let's not forget the others, which are not pictured, but strider. So remember, this is a high pitch continuous, like honking or barking sound. Um, and this is kind of, in, it's in, uh, an emergency, okay? Um, yes, that's it, okay. So here's another picture for location of normal breath sound. So like I was telling you earlier, when we were talking about bronchial, bronchovesicular and vesicular breath sounds, right? So when we're talking about that, you can see in this picture where you're going to see those different types of breath sounds. Okay. So bronchial breath sounds, you're going to find right there in the upper neck. Okay, so if you put a stethoscope up there on his neck where, where that's located, all those bees are located, you'll hear bronchial breath sounds. Okay, your bronchiovesicular breath sounds is right there in the middle over those, um, that kind of sternal area, just in the, the two, those two small spots there on the front. And that's where you're going to hear those bronchovesicular. And then the vesicular is 
like on the whole lung field, which is typically where you're listening to your lung sounds at. Okay. You will need to know um, where to find all of those three types, the bronchial, the bronchovesicular, and the vesicular lung sounds for your physical assessment checkoff and lab. Okay. And then you can see the posterior view of the patient on their back over here to the right. Okay. Right? And here's another really great picture as well. And I like to use this one in lab to kind of show you guys where these are all located. And this one right here actually shows the axial um, view of the lungs as well. So that being like the lateral side, right? So if you look at the second picture from the right, I'm sorry, the second picture from the left, you'll see that that's the lateral side of the patient. And so in your checkoff and lab, you'll be required to also listen to four places on that lateral side, okay? And that's just another visual for you how to understand where to find these, these um, lung sounds. All right, moving on to assessing the cardiovascular system. So assessing the heart. So inspection, we're going to begin with, a set with um, our assessment with the heart with the client sitting. Okay, we're going to look at the area of the chest over the heart and see if we can see any visible pulsations. A small pulsation um, at that fifth intercostal space, where is the point of maximum impulse, which we now know is where we listen to the apical pulse, right? Um, so if we see something like that, just a, a small pulsation, that can be normal. Other pulsations that are larger, um, these can be known as heaves and lifts and are associated with an enlarged ventricle. So we don't want to see very large ones like that. Okay. We want to listen to the heart sounds in a variety of different areas, which we'll talk about. But you want to listen and see if you can, if you hear a normal lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. That's what you should be hearing. Um, you want to see if you hear a murmur or any extra sounds. If you hear a lub dub dub, lub dub dub, lub dub dub, or lub lub dub dub, lub lub dub dub, lub lub dub dub. So if you hear any extra sounds or if you hear a murmur, this is something that needs to be reported. Okay. Um, and so when you talk about palpation, Palpation and feeling a thrill. So a thrill is like a vibration or a pulsation that is palpated with any area except that PMI. So any other area, if you're feeling any kind of vibration or pulsation, that would be called a thrill. Okay, so we want to assess for that as well. Okay, so when we talk about assessing heart sounds, okay, we need to first know the location. Okay, so the location for assessing heart sounds is going to be here on, on your screen to the right. Um, so these five areas for assessing heart sounds, you're gonna have to have memorized because it's part of your assessment checkoff in lab, okay? So over here to the, you know, everybody knows that your heart is on the left side of your chest, right? And so um, you will start by listening to the right side of the chest. And on the right side of the chest at that second intercostal space is gonna be the aortic heart sound. Okay, that's where you can hear it best. And then you're gonna to move to the left side of the chest around the same area, the second intercostal space on the left side of the chest, and that's gonna be your pulmonic spot. You're gonna move down a little bit. You're gonna hear herbs point. You're gonna move down a little bit and hear the tricuspid. And then you're gonna move over to the side and listen to that mitral, okay? Remember when I told you before that the mitral, the apex, the point of maximum impulse and the apical heart rate, those are all the same location, which is right there as seen in this picture under mitral. It's the left side, fifth intercostal, medial to the midclavicular line, okay? And that's, that's all the same, all interchangeable, the same thing, okay? Um, and you can remember the and memorize this by memorizing this bottom little saying here, all people enjoy Time Magazine, okay? So you do need to know where to listen to those. Um, and so you need to know what you're listening for. So you're listening for heart sounds, okay? So the first heart sound is your S1. And this is resulting from the closure of the valves between the atria and the ventricles, okay? So that's your lub sound. It's a dull, low-pitched sound that's loudest over that mitral and tricuspid area, okay? That marks the beginning of the systole, okay? So in other words, it represents mitral and tricuspid valve closure, and that's what you're hearing, okay? And then your second heart sound, which is called S2, or that's your dub from your lub dub, it's your dub. 
and it corresponds to the closure of the semilunar valves between the ventricles and the great arteries ex ex exiting the heart. So the dove is a higher in pitch and shorter than the S1, and the S2 is loudest at the aortic and pulmonic areas. Okay, so in other words, it represents the aortic and pulmonary valve closure at the end of the systole and beginning that diastole. So you should only hear two heart sounds. If you hear a third heart sound, so that would be called an S3, it would be heard immediately after the S2 and it has a gallop type cadence. It sounds like a gallop. Typically it follows the rhythm of the word Kentucky, Kentucky, Kentucky. Okay, that's kind of how it sounds. And it is best heard at the apical site with the client lying on their left side. Can be a normal finding in children and young athletes, but is usually abnormal in older adults and is associated with heart failure. So if you hear a fourth sound, this is heard immediately before the S1. It has a rhythm that follows the word Florida, Florida, right? Okay, so S4 is best heard at the apical site using the bell of the stethoscope. So the bell meaning the small part of the stethoscope. A lot of stethoscopes have two areas to listen. One is large, one is small. The bell is the smaller one, okay? Um, an S4 sound is normal in athletes and some older clients, um, but it may be heard in adults with coronary artery disease, hypertension, and um, pulmonic stenosis as well. You may also hear a murmur. So with a murmur, these are additional sounds that are produced by turbulent blood flow of the heart. Um, some murmurs are innocent, but others may represent a pathology. Um, they're generally graded by intensity, um, with grade one being the smallest and grade six being the largest that can be heard without a stethoscope. And so here's your heart sounds, your S1, which is your tricuspid and mitral valves closing, that's your lub, and then your S2, which is your aortic and um, pulmonic valves closing in your dub, okay? All right. So cardiac auscultation, again, you're gonna to need to know this for lab. So that this is the exact same information here about where to locate heart sounds as it was on my previous picture. So pick whichever picture you like best and memorize it that way, but you will need to know it for your assessment check off. And so moving on to heart and vessels. So when we are talking about central vessels, we're talking about carotid arteries, okay, and internal jugular veins. So these run alongside that sternocleidomastoid muscle on both sides of the neck, okay? These central vessels provide circulation to the brain, and the jugular veins return the blood from the brain to the superior vena cava. External veins are superficial, or external jugular veins are superficial, I'm sorry. In, Internal jugular veins are very deep. Normally, the jugular veins are flat when the client is in an upright position and they distend when the client lays flat, okay? So jugular venous distension or JVD is seen when the right side of the heart is congested due to inadequate pump function, okay? So that just means if you have to look at somebody's neck, you see that vein in there, and it just is so full of blood and it's blue and you can see it and that's just not a good sign. That's called jugular vein distension, okay? That's your jugular vein, right? And then um, when we're talking about peripheral vessels. So remember that peripheral vessels supply blood to all the body cells. So these include arteries and veins that are kind of away from the heart, right? So arteries are a high pressure system with several palpable pulse sites. So all those spots where you can feel the pulse, those are all arteries. Veins are a low pressure system with valves to prevent backflow due to gravity. So the veins return the blood back to the heart via contributing pressure from the arterial system and pumping action of the adjacent skeletal muscles. Okay, that's why Im immobility is a super risk factor to getting a blood clot. Okay, because the skeletal muscle movement of your legs helps get that blood flow back into the, to the heart. So we're talking about assessing the abdomen. So moving on. So as we talked about, we want to inspect first, then auscultate, then percuss, then palpate. Okay, we always listen first, right? So when we're inspecting the abdomen, we need to be looking to see is the abdomen symmetrical? 
Is it rounded in contour or is it sunken? Is their belly button sunken in? Um, you may be able to see peristalsis or an aortic pulsation on a very thin client, but most of the time you will see no movement. Um, in a client that has abdominal distension, the, the, the skin will appear really tight. Some distension may be normal, like with pregnancy, um, and some may be due to bloating with gas or fluid retention, or maybe even a bowel obstruction. Okay, so that's what we're looking for with oscul or with inspection. When auscultating, we're going to use the diaphragm. Okay, like we talked about, stethoscopes have two sides: a diaphragm and a bell. The bell is the small side; the diaphragm is the big side. So we're going to use the diaphragm of the stethoscope in all four quadrants. Okay, so imagine that your belly is divided into four equal squares. Okay, so you draw a line up and down, you draw a line side to side. Now you've got four quadrants in your abdomen. You're going to start listening for bowel sounds in all four quadrants. And you're going to start with that right lower quadrant. And then you're going to move up to that right upper quadrant. And then you're going to move over to that left upper quadrant and then down to that left lower quadrant. And the reason you go in this order is because that follows the order of your bowel, okay? And I also want you to know that the right and left, when talking about right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant, the right and the left is of the person. So not if you're looking at the person, but to the person's left, to the person's right, okay? So normal bowel sound. So when normal, these are high-pitched, irregular gurgles. They sound like gurgles or clicks, and they last one second to several seconds, and they occur about every five to 15 seconds on, in the average adult, okay? So bowel sounds can be normal. They could be hypoactive, which means there's less than five sounds per minute, and they're faint sounding. They could be absent, which means there's nothing, but you have to listen for a full five minutes in order to determine that. And then they could be hyperactive, which means there's more than two to three sounds per second or more than 30 sounds per minute. Okay, that's auscultating. We'll get more into that in a, in a minute, I think. Um, and then percussing, like we talked about, we use indirect percussion to assess for fluid, air, or organs. Generally, there's timpani over the bowels due to the presence of gas. And the abdomen's usually non tender and soft without masses. Okay. So palpating, when we move on to palpating, we begin with light palpation to put the patient at ease. We're going to palpate for tenderness and guarding in all four quadrants. Guarding meaning, is our patient pushing us away because it's painful? Are they saying, oh, please don't touch that spot, it hurts. We want to observe for that. Use deep palpation to assess for organs and masses and tenderness, but be very cautious in doing so. The liver border should be smooth. Remember, um, it's in the right upper quadrant. This should be smooth and without masses, and the spleen is not normally palpable. Palpation of the liver and spleen is an advanced technique not usually performed by staff nurses, though, so and except in some specialty areas. So moving on to the musculoskeletal system. You know, now that I am thinking about this, I don't think, hold on. Nope, looks like I didn't have. Um, okay, so I didn't have in here any more um, information about bowel sounds, okay? But it's important that you go back and you listen to what I said when it, I, we, I talk about normal bowel sounds versus hypoactive versus hyperactive. And that will be reinforced to you in lab this week as well. So that's okay. Okay, so assessing the musculoskeletal system. So we're gonna look at body shape and symmetry. So we're gonna look for major deformities in bone structure um, that may affect posture and gait. Okay, so our client should be able to stand upright with the neck and head midline. That's what we want them to be able to do. There's four normal curvatures of the spine. So the cervical and lumbar are typically concave and that thoracic and sacral area are convex. Okay, so we want to look at that and see if they have, they have scoliosis, they have kyphosis, what's it look like in there? In all of these terms, you can find in more de detail in your book. Okay, so like I said, kyphosis, if you don't know what that looks like, there's detailed pictures in your book. Lordosis, that's an assinuated lumbar curve, okay? Um, like we talked about Romberg's test, we talked about that before, right? We have the patient stand with their feet together and their arms out and they close their eyes and, and we see if they can balance, if they sway or fall, that would be a positive test, right? We wanna test for joint mobility. So joints should move freely and without pain. 
If you hear crepitus, which is clicking or grating at a joint, we want to document that. Um, we want to test the range of motion of all the muscles and joints, right? So remember the active range of motion requires that the client move the joint through its full range of motion themselves. And passive range of motions means that we do it for them, okay? Um, we want to also check the joints for color change and for any deformities that we may see. Um, we want to also check for muscle strength um, along with movement by asking the patient to perform any range of motion. Um, and then we also want to have them let, hold on to our hands, squeeze my hand, and then we determine how well their, their grip strength and their muscle strength is from that, that period. We're going to assess, oh, and the, here's our neurological, just in the same way I talked to you about this at the beginning. Um, testing neurological function, so cerebral function, we're going to test their level of consciousness. So we're going to determine their level of consciousness by describing it. Um, are they alert? Okay. Typically, if you're in an ambulatory setting or just with a normal, just a normal, like very little, a little bit sick patient or something, they're going to be alert. Okay. They're going to be alert, which means they respond, they respond to stimuli. If you talk to them, they respond. If you touch them, they respond. They're alert. Okay. Um, and so also orientation. Are they orientated to time, place, and person? Do you know what year it is? Do you know where you are? Do you know your name? Okay. Those are questions we can ask to get that. Um, and then when you get into more severely sick patients who maybe you're thinking like an ICU, traumatic brain injury or accident or something, and maybe they're in a coma or coming out of a coma, that's when you get to use this fun Glasgow coma scale here on um, this slide. So with that, um, it's just something that we use to, to, to describe the client's response, okay? So as you can see on here, it grades the patient on eye-opening, verbal response, motor response, right? And then it gives them a score um, based on that, okay? And then that will kind of tell you, um, it tells you here, mild, moderate, severe, okay? Are they mild? coma, moderate coma, severe, like how are they responding? And then a lot of physicians will use this to treat um, or to guide treatment better, better yet, okay? Um, and then also mental status and cognitive function. So we're gonna observe their behavior. Is it appropriate to the situation? How do they look? Do they look like they can take care of themselves? Um, what's their response to stimuli? When you touch them, do they respond? When you say their name, do they respond? Is their speech slurred and slow? Are they skipping words? Um, how's their memory and their communication? How's their judgment? And then a cranial nerve assessment. Um, you guys will learn a little bit more about that uh, when it comes to labs. So we're gonna kind of skip that part here in your book. Um, and then other neurological assessments. So reflexes. So deep tendon reflexes, these are automatic responses that do not require conscious thought from the brain, okay? So everybody's probably had your reflexes checked before. A reflex produces a rapid involuntary response that occurs at the level of the spinal cord. Because the brain is not involved, the muscle response is instantaneous. So in order to have a normal reflex response, you must have an intact sensory and motor system. Okay, so each reflex um, corresponds to a certain level of the spinal cord. Okay, so when you're talking about grading scales on for reflexes, you're going to have, do they have plus one reflexes, plus two reflexes, plus three reflexes, plus four, four reflexes. So um, with a zero, if they have a zero on the scale, they have no response. They have no reflexes at all. And so that can be caused um, from, from a lot of different things. I see this sometimes in my unit on a labor unit when we give magnesium for preeclampsia, it can diminish those reflexes. And then a plus four, plus four reflexes is a super, super hyperactive, kick you in the face type reflex. And you'll see that it says clonus next to there. And so clonus with that is where they're just so stimulated, their, their nervous system is so overstimulated that they're, if you push their foot back, it like, um, rhythmically pulses when you let it go, okay? And then with motor and cerebellar function, um, this is going to be talking about the motor pathways that transmit information between the brain and the muscles. 
Um, and so that's what the cerebellum does. It helps coordinate muscle movement, regulates muscle tone, maintains posture, okay? Um, it's also largely responsible for the proprioception or body positioning, okay? So disorders of motor and cerebellar function results in pain or problems with movement, gait, posture, um, equilibrium, that kind of thing. Okay, so we want to monitor for that as well. And then sensory function. When we're assessing sensory function, we're going to ask our client to keep their eyes closed as we um, apply various stimuli. So we may touch them with a cotton ball and we want to say, do you feel sharp or dull? And they'll say dull. And then we want to poke them with a little stick, right? Poke them with the stick. Well, that feels sharp. Okay, we want to make sure that they can um, understand the difference, right? So we want to vary the location where we stimulate them um, so that they don't notice pattern recognition, right? If we notice a, an area of altered sensation, we're going to assess that area to define that order of the change, okay? Um, and then usually we're going to limit our testing to the upper and lower extremities and that kind of thing. Um, we're going to observe for stereogenesis, stereogenosis. So this is the ability to recognize solid objects by touch. Okay, so we give them um, a phone and they are holding it and they realize it's a phone. So they say, this is a phone. Okay, right. And graphesthesia. So this is the ability to recognize symbols that are written on the skin. So if we draw, draw a star on their leg, they'll be able to say, oh, that was a star. Okay. Um, Two-point discrimination. This is where a patient can detect if one or two areas of the skin are being touched. And then point localization. This is the ability to tell where one is being touched at all on their body, right? Oh, you're touching my foot, right? And then a genitourinary assessment as well. So when we're talking about a male genitourinary assessment, um, we're going to um, ask them questions, including reproductive information, if, if it applies. We want to look at the external genitalia, look at the penis. What does it look like? Is the urethral opening where it should be? Because sometimes it's not, and I've got stories about that. Um, the scrotum, what does the scrotum look like? Um, do they have testes that are able to be felt? Are there lymph nodes that are swollen? Is there pubic hair? All of these things are things that we need to assess when it's relevant. Now, I'm not saying we're going to do this assessment in a head-to-toe fashion, like when we're doing a head-to-toe at the hospital, we're not going to assess this every single time. Um, but if, especially if they're there for that issue, we will assess it more often. And then female, um, it includes reproductive information too. When is your, when was your last period? When was your last pap smear, right? Then we look at the female external genitalia, all of these areas and see, are these all, do they all look the way they should look? And then also onto that, when we're talking about doing the actual genitourinary assessment, we're going to um, ask them, when was the last time that you went to the bathroom? When's the last time you peed? What color was it? Did it smell bad? Was it clear? Are you having any urgency or burning or um, frequency, right? Um, we may want to talk to both males and females at this time about um, their, if they're sexually active, any um, abnormal discharge, may, we may want to talk to them about um, sexually transmitted diseases or testing that may be available. Um, and then also kidneys testing for CVA tenderness. So um, that would be kind of doing a little examination on their back where the kidneys are kind of located and seeing if there's any tenderness there upon palpation. And then we want to palpate their bladder, right? It's right there in the bottom of the abdomen. We want to palpate and see if it's distended. Is it full of urine? And again, always asking questions like, are you having any burning when you pee? Any um, frequency, urgency, um, pain, that kind of thing. And then um, an NP or a medical doctor is responsible for assessing the anus, the rectum, doing prostate exams and pelvic exams. Okay. That's all there is to it.